SPIE presents the Advancing the Laser series, honoring 50 years of laser achievements. Hi, I'm Jeff Hecht. I write about lasers and optics. I've been writing about them for uh, 35 years. And we're here at the uh, historic laser exhibit uh, at Photonics West, looking at some of the lasers that have made the laser industry been used in research and development, in scientific applications uh, for the last half century. Uh, there's a lot of, most of the lasers here are devices that were made commercially, many of them by small companies, some of them very small runs, uh, many of them are collector's items. Here we have the notebook uh, in which Ted Maiman noted down the series of experiments that led to the first laser. He's showing uh, in these columns, write, writing how much voltage he used to pulse his flash lamp and the results he observed. Um, uh, and in the front right uh, here is the, a replica of the laser itself, uh, all assembled but without the power supply. Uh, it is indeed as small as it looks. You could hold it comfortably in your hand. Up here uh, is a laser, uh, a more modern neodymium YAG laser, which Maiman designed uh, about 1989 for use in medical research and treatment. Uh, the goal was to make a device that sold to physicians for five to ten thousand dollars, making it more accessible for medical use, which was one of Maiman's major interests in, uh, after he had invented the laser. This is a commercial version of Ted Maiman's first ruby laser made by uh, Hughes Aircraft, the uh, owner of Hughes Research Laboratories. It's essentially uh, uses Maiman's design. Here is a cylinder with a flash lamp and a ruby rod. In back of it is the power supply uh, used. You'll note as with the, all these kind of devices uh, you had quite a bit more power supply than you had laser because you had to produce a high voltage to uh, produce flashes of light from the flash lamp. Uh, you also needed to charge up a capacitor to produce that high voltage and uh, this was made in 1962. This is an old spectrophysics model 125 laser. Uh, it dates probably from the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, it's, been, it's still operational. Bob Hess, who's a collector who has accumulated many of these lasers, has been using it to make holograms with. Uh, you'll note it's very long. This emits about 50 to 65 milliwatts of red light. That is one of the making it one of the most powerful helium neon lasers ever made. As we came into the 25th anniversary of the laser, uh, this was actually a bit before the 25th anniversary of the laser, though, um, there was a lot of interest in holography. And National Geographic in March 1984 uh, published a hologram on the cover. This is a uh, Benton uh, rainbow hologram invented by Steve Benton of uh, Polaroid and MIT. Uh, other magazines uh, produced and used these. There was a time where a lot, a lot of books and magazines would use these rainbow holograms as cover, cover displays, attractive devices. Now they're primarily used on credit cards. These are small helium neon laser tubes. You would actually have uh, a uh, power supply box separate from them that you would use to drive, drive the laser. Uh, these are the metal tube here is pretty indestructible. Uh, I was at a uh, conference one time talking about military uses of lasers. We handed one to a general to use as a laser pointer, and he dropped it, applying the uh, what the military calls the brass hat test to it. We picked it up; it worked. Here is an early 1980s spectrophysics model, a uh, helium neon laser uh, with external mirrors. This is a glass amplifier slab uh, that of the type used in the National Ignition Facility at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Last month, NIF generated a laser pulse at a record one megajoule, uh, the highest pulse energy ever produced from a laser. The light from a, an oscillator passes through a series of these glass amplifiers and the, 
there are 192 parallel chains of these glass amplifiers, which then all focus the light down to a single uh, small target that would be millimeter scale. If you compare the size of NIF, now, occupying a huge building, to Ted Maiman's laser, which could hold in the palm of your hand, you see how far laser technology has gone in 50 years. You have lasers in CD players, you have lasers in, in the telecommunication systems that make up the global fiber optic network and that are the backbone of the internet and the global telecommunication system. There may be lasers in your home. I have fiber to the home uh, in my house and there's a laser in the basement that talks back to the telecommunication system and receives optical signals coming in from lasers in the telecommunication system. So lasers are now everywhere.